joining us today to learn more about uh, New York State's upcoming essential plans. We appreciate you making the time to join us this morning uh, for a webinar brought to you by the Children, Youth, and Families Task Force of Healthcare for All New York. My name is Andrew Leonard, and I am the Senior Policy Associate for Health, Housing, and Income Security for the Children's Defense Fund New York. And I'll be presenting today along with Amy Lowenstein, a senior attorney with the Empire Justice Center. We have a packed presentation today uh, for you all, so we're going to dive right into the material. But I quickly want to direct your attention to a few housekeeping notes before we get started. Uh, first, we're excited to say we have almost 400 people registered for this event. Uh, but for that reason, we'll keep all of your phone lines on mute during the presentation. Uh, we're going to be giving you a lot of information, so we want to make sure that we have time at the end of the presentation for you to ask questions. Um, but thankfully, you won't need to remember your question until the end. Uh, I'd add, ask you that as questions come up, I'll direct you to the GoToWebinar panel uh, on the right side of your screen. And I'd ask you to just type in questions as we go into the chat box. So at the bottom of that GoToWebinar gray panel, you'll see the chat. Uh, you can type your question right in there, and that will go to the, uh, the organizers of the event. And we'll do our best to get through as many of those as we can uh, at the end of the hour. So as they come up, just make sure you uh, type them in. Uh, I want to note that the slides will be posted. Uh, they're going to be posted at uh, Healthcare for All New York's website, which is hickfanny.org, H-C-F-A-N-Y.org. That should be later on today. Uh, and we're also going to send them out in an email uh, early next week to anyone who registered for today's event. Um, I'll also direct your attention to, once more to that gray bar on the side of the screen. Uh, just above the chat box, you'll see a, a small column there that says handouts, and below that a, a link to a PDF file that says essential plan flyer. Um, that is a one-pager that Healthcare for All New York uh, developed along with the Healthcare Education Project of uh, SEIU 1199. It's in English and Spanish, um, and we want to make that available to all of you. Uh, it's a quick kind of rundown of the basics of the essential plan, and uh, you are welcome to share that. Additionally, we're going to be recording today's webinar, and we'll make that available as well. And we would also encourage you to share that with anyone who is interested. Uh, so Amy Lowenstein, who through her work with the Empire Justice Center and the Public Programs Group of Healthcare for All New York and Medicaid Matters New York, uh, has worked really closely with the state throughout the development of the Essential Plan, and she is going to get us started today. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Amy. Thanks, Andrew. Good morning, everybody. So uh, we're going to get started talking about the Essential Plan, which is a new affordable health care insurance option that's going to be available on New York's healthcare exchange. The agenda for today is I'm going to briefly give you some background on why we have an essential plan and then go in depth about the somewhat complicated eligibility rules. Then I'm going to hand it back over to Andrew and he will talk to you about benefit design, the enrollment process, and appeals. And then as Andrew said, at the end we can talk about questions. So let's get started on the background. The essential plan is actually called the Basic Health Program under the Affordable Care Act. It was an option for states to create an affordable insurance product that would have premiums that are as affordable or more affordable than standard subsidized marketplace coverage, as well as affordable cost sharing and also these plans would provide minimally the essential health benefits that are available through all the QHPs. In New York, the essential plan is the basic health pr program. So that's what New York is calling their basic health program. It's estimated that making the essential plan in New York will save New York $300 million annually. So that's a significant savings. There are only two states that have taken up the essential plan option, and New York is one of them. The other state is Minnesota, which started their essential plan January 1, 2015. Ours is starting a little later, although, as you will learn, it's, it's actually already here. It's just that nobody knows. So let's talk about eligibility. In general, and I'm going to get into more detail about um, eligibility, but in general there are four groups of people who are going to go into the essential plan. 
First, it's people who used to get the Family Health Plus program in New York. This was um, for people who were above the Medicaid level up to 150% of poverty. And those people are currently in the marketplace, hopefully getting advanced premium tax credits and cost sharing. And in addition, the state has been helping them pay the remainder of their premiums. So they're in what's called the Advanced Premium Tax Credit Assistance Program. In addition, people who are income eligible qualified health plan enrollees will be moving to the essential plan. And we'll talk about the income eligibility. So this means that if somebody is currently in a qualified health plan and income eligible for the essential plan, they're going to start getting their insurance through the essential plan instead of the qualified health plan. Also, lawfully present ALISA immigrants who are on Medicaid will move to the essential plan. Now, I know I just said a bunch of words that may mean nothing to people, like what is lawfully present, what is ALISA, and I will explain those terms. But basically, these are people who are in specific immigration categories who are currently getting Medicaid, and the state's going to move them over to the essential plan. And so those are all the people who are currently getting insurance who will move over. There's another group of people who are going to be eligible for the essential plan, but they're not currently insured. And these are going to be people who never applied for insurance but are eligible for by income or, or immigration status. And also people who may have applied on the exchange, purchased something like a bronze plan, but the insurance, uh, the premiums were too high and they just couldn't afford to keep it. So this is the basic eligibility for the essential plan. First of all, you, like qualified health plans um, for advanced premium tax credits, you can't be eligible for other minimal essential coverage or Medicaid or Child Health Plus. And this includes employer insurance. So the same rule applies that if somebody is eligible for affordable minimal essential coverage, they're not going to be able to enroll in the essential plan. Also, people who are on Medicare are not eligible. The age requirement is for people who are between 19 and 64. It's actually technically 64 and younger, but in New York, all children under 19 are eligible for Child Health Plus, and they're not eligible for the essential plan because they already have an option. And finally, people are going to have to meet citizen and immigration requirements and the corresponding income requirements because depending on somebody's citizen or immigration status, that's going to affect what income they need to have to go into the essential plan. And that's where things start to get a little complicated. But let's walk through it. So when you think about the essential plan, it's almost like there's two essential plans. There is one for US citizens and lawfully present non-citizens. This includes green card holders. And um, that's for people who are between 139 and 200% of poverty. People below that level who are U.S. citizens and lawfully present non-citizens, they're getting Medicaid, so they don't, they're not going to need this essential plan. But there's a second essential plan, and this is for people who are lawfully present illicit immigrants. These are people who are currently on Medicaid in an immigration status that does not allow them to get um, Medicaid from the federal government, only the state. And I'll talk more about that. They are going to have the essential plan if their income is up to 138% of poverty. And right now they're currently in Medicaid, but in 2016 they will be moved to the essential plan. And the group that's up to 138% of poverty, it's only the lawfully present or illicit immigrants who will go in there. So U.S. citizens would not go into the essential plan if they have the lower incomes. They would go to Medicaid. And let's talk about lawfully present, this term. Only U.S. citizens and lawfully present immigrants and non-immigrant visa holders are eligible for the essential plan or qualified health plans. Now, lawfully present is not an immigration term. It's not a term used by the Department of Homeland Security. It's a term used to classify whether non-citizens are eligible for certain benefits, like Medicaid. And you can't guess who is lawfully present. You have to just know who's on the list, what's, what immigration statuses are on the list. And I've provided the ACA regulation that's 
lists them, but it does cross-reference other regulations as well. All right, now we know what lawfully present is. Let's talk about illicit immigrants. And before I do that, I just want to give you a little background on Medicaid in case you're not familiar. Medicaid is a joint state and federal program. So the federal government provides funding and the state provides funding. Now, there are some immigrants, even some who are lawfully present, who are not eligible to have their Medicaid paid for by the state. And what happened was, in 2001, there was a New York Court of Appeals decision called Alyssa v. Novello that established eligibility for these people who couldn't get federal Medicaid to be able to get the state to pay for their Medicaid entirely. So Alyssa immigrants do not get federal Medicaid, but they get Medicaid just like everybody else. It's just that the state is paying for it. There are three groups of people who fall into the Alyssa immigrant category. It includes qualified aliens who are in a five-year Medicaid waiting period, because you can't get Medicaid in your first five years, so that's green card holders who are in the five-year waiting. It includes lawfully present immigrants permanently residing under color of law, or PRUCAL. Now, PRUCAL are people who are in the United States with permission or acquiescence of Homeland Security. Basically, the U.S. knows they're here, but it's not actively pursuing removal. And so they are entitled to state-funded Medicaid in New York. And this actually includes some people who are not immigrants, but they're in a valid non-immigrant visa status. So that might be students or people who have a temporary work visa. The third group of illicit immigrants are people who we are calling PRUCAL only because they're not considered lawfully present under the benefits rules. So all of these illicit immigrants, as I said before, are eligible for New York State funded Medicaid, but not federally funded Medicaid. Now there is a little exception. Children under 21 and pregnant women get federal Medicaid, so they're not technically illicit immigrants. Okay. So as I said before, not all illicit immigrants are lawfully present. We have this PRUCAL only category. And they are, some of them are actually explicitly excluded from the definition of lawfully present. And that includes people who are DACA and DAPA, that's the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals and Deferred Action for Parents of Americans and lawfully, Lawful Permanent Residents. Now, nobody is actually currently DAPA or, um, or even expanded DACA because that was part of an executive order that is being challenged in a lawsuit right now. But generally, there is the DACA category, and there are other people who are PRUCAL only. So the illicit immigrants who are PRUCAL only are not eligible for the essential plan, and they're also not eligible for qualified health plans they're only eligible for state-funded Medicaid if they're income eligible. Now I want to take a little aside here because this comes up sometimes to help people distinguish between someone who's DACA, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, and someone who might be in an other kind of deferred action status. Um, other people who might have deferred action are people who have sought humanitarian relief from removal, maybe because of a serious medical condition or a natural disaster in their homeland. So the reason it matters is, as I said, DACA will stay in Medicaid. Other people in a deferred action status will move to the essential plan. So here's the, here's the big key to how you know if you're talking to somebody and they say they're deferred action. DACA beneficiaries have a work authorization code of C33 and other deferred action beneficiaries have a work authorization code of C14. Okay, so the essential plan and lawfully present illicit immigrants, how does it work together? Most, and I say most, lawfully present illicit immigrants 
with incomes at or below 138% of poverty will be moved from the essential plan. I mean, will be moved to the essential plan from Medicaid. But remember, this is because there's no federal, federal contribution towards their Medicaid. So moving them from New York State funded Medicaid to the essential plan means New York State will get federal assistance towards the cost of their care for the first time. Now I said on an earlier slide that most people will move. Things are a little complicated, um, as they always are with health insurance, so not all lawfully present illicit immigrants are going to move to the essential plan. Some will stay in Medicaid, and these are people who need long-term home or personal care, people who need nursing home care, Medicaid waiver recipients, so people who are in the OPWDD, the Office for People with Developmental Disabilities Waiver, the Traumatic Brain Injury Waiver, the Nursing Home Transition Diversion Waiver, they are going to stay in Medicaid. Also, people who are in health and recovery plans will stay in Medicaid. Now, quickly, people probably don't know what health and recovery plans are yet. They are brand new. They're a Medicaid managed care package with an enhanced behavioral health benefit and they're rolling out in New York City in October and the rest of the state next year. So um, they're called HARPs. So what can happen is you might have a family where there's a parent who's getting long-term home care, but um, another parent isn't and the child isn't, and you can have people in three different insurances even though they all have the same income. So the person getting home care will be in Medicaid, the spouse who's not getting home care will be in the essential plan, and the child will be in Child Health Plus. So this is a summary of what adult marketplace coverage is going to look like by immigration status in 2016. And I just so you can look at this, but just to review, you can see in the blue the only, the people who are going to get Medicaid are the people who are pro call only because they have no other options and the citizens and lawfully present non-citizens who are not ALISA. The essential plan, which is the red, that's for lawfully present ALISA immigrants, and they can get it all the way up to 200% of poverty, as well as citizens and lawfully present non-citizens who can get it between 139 and 200% of poverty. But looking at the pro call, you can see there's this cliff where there's no more insurance after the Medicaid level. All right, now I'm going to acknowledge something, having, having dragged you all through a little bit of an immigration training. Health and coverage and its intersection with immigration status is complicated. I mean, we all know health insurance is complicated. Immigration is complicated. You put it together and, you know, it's a morass. So Empire Justice Center, and actually specifically Barbara Weiner, developed a crosswalk, which is a handy desk reference you can use to look up people's statuses and try to figure out what insurances they are eligible for. So I, there's a link to this, and it's available on the Empire Justice Center website. Because it's so complicated, um, I want you to keep an eye out for another tool that we think will help. And this is something Andrew Leonard is developing. It's going to be a questionnaire that will help people evaluate what insurance they're eligible for. It's not going to be a big picture piece like the crosswalk. It's going to be more for individuals. Um, and it adds an income dimension to it as well. So you'll be able to plug in people's income generally and figure out the insurance eligibility. So before we wrap up the eligibility section, I just want to talk about a few special populations that you can't really intuit what plan they're going to go into, whether it's Medicaid or the essential plan. And the first is 19 and 20 year olds who have always had special rules. So all 19 and 20 year olds who live with a parent get Medicaid if their income is at or below 155% of poverty, except undocumented immigrants. So this is US citizens, this is proof call only, this is 
lawfully present Alyssa, green card holders, they all get Medicaid. They have a higher Medicaid level if they live with their parents. They will move to the essential plan if their income go, goes above that 155% um, of poverty, unless, of course, they're undocumented. And if they're pro call only, they hit that unfortunate insurance cliff and they have no options for affordable insurance. There's another group of 19 and 20 year olds who don't live with a parent. Their Medicaid income level is the same as adults. It's 138% of poverty. But they're all going to stay on Medicaid. They're not going to move to the essential plan. This means citizens. It means lawfully present Alyssa. It means pro call only. They're all staying on Medicaid. They will go to the essential plan if their income goes above the Medicaid level, unless, again, they're undocumented or pro call only. All right, another special population is pregnant women. Pregnant women get Medicaid, not the essential plan. That's it. End of story. All pregnant women in New York get Medicaid if their income is at or below 223% of poverty. This is true of lawfully present illicit immigrants. They will not be moved from Medicaid to the essential plan. And actually, it's also true of undocumented pregnant women. So because they can get Medicaid, pregnant women are not eligible for the essential plan. I am aware that the state is planning on figuring out a way of identifying when somebody who is on the essential plan gets pregnant so they will transition to Medicaid. I, we don't have great detail on how that will work, but it's going to involve pregnancy-related billing codes, I'm assuming. So that's something to watch out for. OK, so I just want to emphasize something, because I think it sometimes gets lost. People cannot choose between the essential plan and a qualified health plan with advanced premium tax credits. This is a new insurance affordability program, and you can only be eligible for one based on income. So you can't decline the essential plan. Say somebody was in a qualified health plan that they really liked, or maybe the new essential plan options don't have their doctors. This, this may be something we need to look out for. You know, and they want to stay in it, and they want to keep getting cost sharing reductions and advanced premium tax credits. They can't do that. If they want health insurance through the marketplace that's affordable, they're going to have to go in the essential plan if they're income eligible. Now, they could still have the option of, of doing a full pay qualified health plan, but that's really unrealistic for most people. I also want to touch on a special population that's completely ineligible for the essential plan, but I want you to know what's going to happen to them. People who are 65 or older are not as eligible for the essential plan. Under no circumstances will they be in the essential plan unless something goes wrong. But people 65 and over who have incomes between 100 and 200 percent of poverty are going to still be able to get advanced premium tax credits and cost sharing reductions with a QHP if they're eligible. Now, most people who are 65 are, in fact, not eligible to get advanced premium tax credits because they get Medicare. But there are some people, more than you would think, who are not eligible for free Medicare, and they're allowed to get a qualified health plan, and they're allowed to get cost sharing reductions and advanced premium tax credits. And we've been told that this population will still be able to access that benefit. So that is something that we're looking out for to see what, how these people fare, because we don't actually have currently a description of what those cost sharing reductions are going to look like in 2016. Okay, finally, I have this slide that if you like it, you can blow it up and turn it into a big poster. But it summarizes what the insurance coverage on the marketplace is going to look like in 2016. And it gives you, the, you can see in red, where the essential plan comes into play. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Andrew to talk about benefit design. Great. Thank you, Amy. Okay. Excellent. So 
What I'm going to do is I'll talk a little bit about the benefit design of the essential plan and the cost sharing that consumers will see. And then I'll take some time to talk about um, sort of the timeline of how the essential plan will be rolled out and how enrollment will go for consumers looking to either transition from a, an existing plan or enroll for the first time in essential plan. Uh, and then I'll touch briefly on appeals before ending. So if you've noticed, that the essential plan is something of a mix between a QHP uh, and Medicaid. Uh, it kind of borrows from each of those for its design. So as we go through, I'll try and point out where it's more like a QHP and where it's more like Medicaid. But let's start with talking about the benefits. So as Amy mentioned at the, the top of the slideshow, the essential plan is going to cover those same 10 essential health benefits that are covered under the qualified health plan. So those are things like hospital stays, doctor's visits, lab work, mental health, and more. Uh, those will all be covered under the essential plan. And technically, maternity care is a part of the essential plan, but I just want to note, as Amy had mentioned uh, in just a couple slides ago, that uh, women who become pregnant, uh, it's sort of a non-issue in the essential plan. They'll just Accessing maternity care won't be a part of the essential plan. They'll be transitioned into Medicaid. Uh, so just a note about that. Uh, consumers who are in that category of between 139% to 200% of the federal poverty level who are not uh, below the Medicaid threshold, they'll have an option to buy a dental and vision uh, package included in their plan. If you remember, the 10 essential health benefits include pediatric dental and vision, but they don't include adults. So consumers will have uh, the option to purchase that coverage uh, at an additional cost. Additionally, they'll also be able to purchase the same standalone dental plans that are available to consumers in the qualified health plan. Um, there'll be a few added things to the essential plan. There'll be a sort of specialized care coordination and care management sort of inherent in the uh, kind of managed care product. Uh, but one of the really important things to note is that there will be a set of wrapped services for consumers who are at or below the Medicaid threshold. For, so for that lawfully present uh, immigrant group, they'll still have access to the types of services that they would have received under Medicaid. And that's really uh, to satisfy a clause that consumers be no worse off than they were under the state-only Medicaid program. So basically, those will be wrapped. They some of those services will be provided uh, or covered through their the essential plan provider, uh, like their non-prescription drugs, orthotic devices. Uh, it's important to note that those folks who are under the Medicaid threshold but in the essential plan will have access to vision care and dental. That will be part of their benefit, and they'll access that through their essential plan. And there will be a couple of services that are also offered, uh, covered through the directly through the Department of Health, uh, the two most important being non amendment non-emergency medical transportation, uh, and family planning and reproductive health services under the free access policy. And just as a reminder, that free access policy uh, means that consumers who are in uh, an essential plan network won't, have, won't be restricted to go just to the providers in the network to go for those family planning services. So that's the, the benefit design. Let's talk a little bit about how the consumers, uh, what they'll see in terms of out-of-pocket costs. Uh, so if, for the most part, the benefits align more closely with QHPs, uh, I'd say the costs are probably closer to Medicaid, at least for most of the consumers. So let's just focus in on this chart on the left side, so the columns for EP1 and EP2. These are sort of the two main cost-sharing breakout groups, and I'll discuss what's on the right in a second. So for that, I want to draw your attention to two important things, actually, across all these four groups. You'll notice that the premium is very low. Uh, one group that 151 to 200% has a $20 monthly premium, uh, but for folks at 139% or, uh, sorry, at 150% or below, there's no premium. And for anyone who's on the essential plan, there's no deductible. Uh, so that's where some really major uh, cost sharing comes in. You'll see that folks in the higher income bracket do have that monthly premium, uh, and they do have an out-of-pocket cap at $2,000. Uh, and for that group, 151 to 200%, they will have some cost sharing, which I'll go into a little bit more in a second. Uh, but for the rest, that group that's at 150 and below, there's very little cost sharing, almost basically none. So uh, for consumers who 
are between 100 and 150 percent of the federal poverty. So we're looking at those two columns, the EP2 and EP3. They will have no premium, no deductible, very small out-of-pocket costs, and their only cost sharing uh, will be for prescription drugs. Uh, so you'll see in a second that things like doctor's visits, inpatient stays, there will be no uh, cost sharing when they, no out-of-pocket costs for them. The only uh, point is for those uh, prescription medications. For consumers below 100 percent of poverty level, they will have no cost sharing at all, no cost sharing for prescription medications. And again, that's to uh, align with the Medicaid uh, cost sharing structure. So let's take a closer look at the group that's between 151 and 200 percent of the poverty level. This is, uh, you'll see, uh, definitely improved cost sharing uh, from the equivalent uh, silver level plan when you factor in cost sharing reductions for a person with the same income in that stretch between 151 and 200. Uh, and it's just as a reminder again, as Amy mentioned, someone who is eligible for the essential plan based on their income. Uh, is not also eligible for qualified health plan with financial assistance. They can do the full pay, but they can't do it with financial assistance. And the, the, this slide and the one that will follow it just are, are here to show uh, really the improved affordability of the essential plan. So in this, the higher income group with the slightly higher cost sharing, you'll see that premiums in the essential plan are more affordable. You would expect about anywhere from about $60 to $120 for a single person at a silver level plan at that income stretch uh, compared to just $20. And one of the major cost savings for consumers is getting rid of that deductible. So even though 250 in the scope of some of the other options on the marketplace is relatively low and affordable, getting that down to zero is just a really important leap uh, for consumers in this income stretch. If you take a look at the, some of the further cost sharing, you'll see that it is uh, appreciably lower than the silver level plan. So uh, it's $150 per admission in an inpatient facility as opposed to $250. Uh, the primary care visit is the same, uh, but the specialist care is about $10 cheaper. So it's slightly cheaper. You'll notice that for emergency room uh, services and for ambulance services, uh, that cost sharing, that out-of-pocket cost is the same, uh, and that is uh, an intentional decision uh, as a sort of incentive uh, away from over ER use uh, towards a more primary care setting. But when we look at the 139 to 150 group, we see some really major cost sharing difference where we see a huge bump in affordability for consumers. So uh, again, this group uh, 139 to 150 has no premium at all, uh, as opposed to about a $50 monthly premium uh, that they would have gotten in a silver level plan with cost sharing reductions. No deductible, a far lower out-of-pocket maximum, uh, and then no cost sharing at all for out-pocket uh, for most services. So nothing for inpatient, outpatient, PCP, you can read down the list. Uh, so that's a major savings for people in this income bracket. The only difference is that there is some cost sharing for uh, prescription drugs, as I mentioned earlier. So uh, if it's quite low, either it's going to be one or three dollars, depending on the medication. And just a quick note for so this column on the right here, we're talking about 139 to 150. Uh, for the consumers who are between 100 and 138 of the poverty level, they'll also have that same dollar, three dollar cost sharing for prescription medication. Their cost sharing will look exactly the same as that column. For consumers below 100%, they'll have $0 cost sharing for prescription drugs. So that'll read zeros all the way down. So you can see it's a pretty major savings uh, for consumers going into the essential plan. So now I'll talk about enrollment and appeals. So let's start with a brief overview of what's going on. So, you know, we've been saying the essential plan is starting in January, and really that's true. But uh, at least behind the scenes, the essential plan has been built into the marketplace starting in April of this year. Um, so basically, consumers didn't see a change starting in April of 2015. But on the back end of the marketplace system, uh, those lawfully present uh, Alyssa immigrant consumers who are currently in state-only Medicaid uh, were basically saw a code switch. Now, they were then being billed as essential plan consumers rather than as Medicaid consumers. Um, the consumers didn't see any change there. 
customers all on the back end. It won't be until November that they start to see the change. So we all know that open enrollment is just around the corner starting in November 1st. That'll be the first time that consumers can apply uh, for marketplace coverage uh, with the essential plan. Uh, folks who are coming up for renewal who are already in the marketplace uh, will be able to make changes to their account that affect the following year starting on the 16th of November. So November is really when people will start to interact with the essential plan. And then coverage uh, for essential plan services will begin at the first of the year, January 1st, uh, 2016. So I'm going to do a, a bit of a deeper dive first on some of these transitions uh, over the next two slides, and then I'll kind of pull back a little bit, and we'll talk about some of the main enrollment points. So let's talk about the group that's coming up for renewals. So these are people who are currently in the marketplace, have insurance through some marketplace program, uh, and as of uh, this coming open enrollment, will be newly eligible for the essential plan. So in October, renewal notices will be sent out. Uh, and most consumers will, will have to more than likely come back and update their information for eligibility determination in the marketplace. So let's first look at that group that's between 139 and 200% of the poverty level. So when they come in at renewal, they'll get their, their notice and they'll have to come in and update their info and uh, uh, select an essential plan. And they'll have to do that between November 16th and December 15th for coverage to begin on the 1st. Now you might be thinking, why do they have to wait until the 16th? Remember, uh, just like last year, if a consumer comes in before that date and makes a change to their account, it'll affect their current plan year. So we want to make sure that when people are coming in, they're coming in, uh, they're making that change and selecting a plan uh, after the 16th to make that change for the upcoming uh, 2016 plan year. So that's when they'll actually be able to select and enroll in uh, an essential plan after the 16th. Uh, some individuals may be auto-enrolled in the essential plan. That's just something to keep an eye out for. Uh, now let's take a look at that, uh, the lawfully present uh, ELISA group. So these are the folks that are currently in state-only Medicaid and will be transitioning uh, into the essential plan. So. In October, they'll be notified of their eligibility for the essential plan beginning January 1. And they'll have to come in and either choose an essential plan or just be automatically enrolled into the sister essential plan of their Medicaid managed care provider, their carrier. Uh, if, that, if the particular uh, managed care plan that they are in is not also offering an essential plan, they'll have to come into the marketplace and select a plan by December 31st uh, to begin coverage for January 1st. And I'll get in why that different, uh, there's a different date, 15th for people above 139 for selecting a plan and uh, the 31st for below. Uh, but for now, just remember that uh, folks who are between 139 and 200 will have to come in and make a change between the 16th of November and the 15th of December. And uh, that state-only Medicaid population that's transitioning in we'll have until the 31st to select a plan. So for consumers who are new to the marketplace or maybe had coverage and dropped it at some point but are now newly eligible for the essential plan, starting on the 1st of November, they'll be able to come into the marketplace and enroll and select a plan, uh, an essential plan. So for that group that's between 139 and 200%, uh, again, they'll have to select a plan before the 15th of December if they want to have their coverage begin right on January 1st of 2016. Uh, applicants who fall into that lawfully present ELISA category will have until the 31st to select a plan. Uh, now there's a group um, that's transitioning in from the local districts or from HRA if you're in the city. They uh, will be transitioned into the essential plan, uh, but that process is being developed and that will happen at their 2016 Medicaid recertification. So let's talk a little bit about the general rules uh, of enrollment through the essential plan. Consumers, uh, as we said, will be able to enroll through the marketplace. So that's part of the state's sort of one-stop shop mantra where they can come in for Medicaid, CHIP, a qualified health plan or the essential plan, so it'll be that one-stop eligibility uh, determination. 
and as of November, uh, consumers will be able to enroll at any time throughout the year. Uh, they won't be restricted to the open enrollment period. They'll have 12 months. Uh, they can come in at any time during any 12 months of the year to enroll in the plan. So just like Medicaid or CHIP, where you don't have to wait for a special enrollment period or the open enrollment period, you'll have all the time enrollment. One of the uh, enrollment rules that kind of likens the essential plan to the qualified health plan over Medicaid is how income discrepancies uh, are dealt with. A consumer who comes in and their income doesn't match up with what the system is showing for them uh, will have 90 days. Uh, they'll be enrolled in the essential plan if they attest to their income being uh, eligible. And they'll have 90 days to clarify that discrepancy with additional documentation. Uh, they will not be pended for enrollment uh, as if it was uh, in Medicaid. Uh, consumers will have their eligibility redetermined every 12 months. And I should note that when consumers are entering their income information, unlike Medicaid, consumers will have to use their projected 12-month uh, income. They won't be able to use their current monthly income. Uh, that being said, redetermination will happen every 12 months. Uh, if they have a life status change or an income change, they will be expected uh, to report that to the marketplace. And there is not 12-month continuous coverage. So while there is 12-month enrollment where you can enroll at any time, you do not have a guaranteed 12-month coverage out of the year. So if you go in and report an income change and you are found no longer eligible for an essential plan, uh, you will be transitioned into a qualified health plan. One important thing to note is that consumers enrolling in the essential plan will not have a reconciliation process uh, come tax time. So if it turns out that their income was too high uh, and they actually did not uh, qualify for uh, the essential plan, there will not be uh, no hit on their uh, taxes once they go to file. So the effective date of enrollment will really depend on a consumer's income. So if they are between 139 uh, to 200% of the income, so that uh, group that was previously eligible for a qualified health plan that was not eligible for Medicaid and is now eligible for the essential plan, it will look prospective just like the QHB. So if a consumer comes in before the 15th of a month, their income, I'm sorry, their coverage will begin on the first of the following month. If they come in after the 15th, their coverage will uh, become effective on the first of the second month after enrollment. And we'll give some examples in a moment to highlight that. Uh, for those who are, were previously be eligible for the state-only Medicaid, who are having incomes below 138% of the poverty level, at or below that level, their coverage will become effective on the first of the month in which they select an essential plan and they'll have uh, an option to receive three months retroactive Medicaid from the date they select a plan. So that's a little bit different from how it is in Medicaid where your coverage is effective the first of the month in which you apply for Medicaid and you get three months prior to the date of your application. An essential plan is going to be the day you select a plan. That's when your coverage uh, in that month is when your coverage will begin and your three months retro Medicaid will be based on that. And again, we'll highlight this with a couple uh, examples. So let's look at this first one for Elena. Elena's household income is at 149% of the federal poverty level. So that means she's above the 138 Medicaid threshold. So she's going to be in that uh, middle income group between 139 and 150. She applies for and selects a plan on, on the marketplace, an essential plan, on May 14th. And because she's in that previous QHP eligibility range, her coverage will start on the following month. So she's applying before the 15th in May. So that next month, June, uh, is when her coverage will begin. So let's take a look at the case of Joao. Joao is a lawfully present uh, Aliesa status immigrant. And his household income is at 130% of the federal poverty level. So right away we know that based on his immigration status, he is likely to be eligible for the essential plan. And with his income eligibility, he is below the Medicaid threshold, so we would expect him to be eligible uh, for the essential plan. And at that uh, very reduced cost-sharing level. 
So he applies for the essential plan and selects a plan on May 30th of 2016. The start date of his essential plan would then be May 1st uh, of, uh, of 2016. So even though he selected a plan on May 30th, his coverage begins at the first of that month because it's following the Medicaid rules or uh, rules very closely aligned with Medicaid, only slight differences. And because uh, he is in that former state-only Medicaid eligibility group, he would be uh, eligible for retroactive Medicaid for February, March, and April. And just a note here, uh, say that he were to have a long-term care need. Uh, I didn't mention this earlier, I meant to. Uh, the home care benefit in the qualified health plan, sorry, in the essential plan will be the same as it is in the essential health plan. And that's because, as we've mentioned, uh, if someone has a need for long-term care, is enrolling in the essential plan but in their Medicaid is below 138, they will either stay in Medicaid if they're already there or be directed to apply for Medicaid. Uh, so if this were the case for Joao and he noted that he had a uh, long-term care need, uh, he would not be enrolled in the essential plan, he would be enrolled in Medicaid. So let's look at this last scenario for Ella. Ella is in a lawfully present Aliesa status. Uh, her household income is at 130% of the poverty level. So again, we know based on the status she's eligible and based on her income she uh, would be in that former state only Medicaid group but is now eligible for the essential plan. She applies on the marketplace. She initiates her application on May 30th of 2016. Uh, but for whatever reason she doesn't select a plan until June 10th of 2016. And the start date of her coverage is going to be June 1st, 2016 and she'd be eligible for retroactive coverage for March, April, and May. Now this example is here to highlight the difference between the essential plan enrollment rules and the Medicaid rules. Were she applying under Medicaid, her coverage would have began on May 1st, 2016 because it would start at the, or not sorry, uh, yeah, sorry, on May, thir May 1st, 2016 uh, because it would begin on the, in the month of her application. But for the essential plan, remember, it's on. it begins the first of the month in which you select a plan. So since Ella, in this case, selected a plan on the 10th of June, her coverage begins in June, uh, and she has three months retro from then. So I want to touch on appeals quickly. It's going to be very closely linked to the procedure for the qualified health plan. So eligibility issues will... Uh, go through the same marketplace uh, appeal process <coughs> that's currently in place. Uh, consumers will have a right to aid continuing during that time. For service-related issues, uh, consumers will go through the internal plan appeal first. Uh, then they can appeal that uh, externally through the Department of Financial Services. Uh, and. Uh, in this process, unlike in Medicaid, they will not have access to aid continuing. So a, a quick note about these external appeals. Uh, for other, I believe for uh, qualified health plans, if you have an external appeal, there's a small cost related to filing an appeal with the Department of Financial Services. That will not be the case uh, for the essential plan. There won't be a cost for an external appeal. So uh, lastly, I'll just quickly outline again some of the differences between the essential plan and Medicaid. Um, so as we mentioned, the service pr uh, appeal process will be internal first for the essential plan uh, and then Department of Financial Services appeal. Uh, but in essential plan consumers will not have uh, access to a, a OTDA fair hearing um, as they would if they were in Medicaid. Additionally, the standard of review for consumers going through appeal is different. Um, Standard of review is a stricter medical necessity for the essential plan while it's broader under the Medicaid rules. And uh, consumers in Medicaid have access to aid continuing throughout while that's not the case for consumers in the essential plan. In terms of eligibility, there are a few differences we've mentioned. In Medicaid, if, as long as you can show in one month that you're eligible for Medicaid, you're guaranteed for the course of 12 months that you'll have coverage even if your income changes and you go above the Medicaid threshold. That, at least for right now, is not the case in the essential plan. Uh, if you are a consumer in the essential plan and your projected annual income at, when you go to apply and select a plan shows that you are eligible for the essential plan, you'll be enrolled. 
But if in the course of 12 months before your annual redetermination, uh, your income changes or you have a life status change, you report that to the marketplace and that finds that you are no longer eligible for the essential plan, uh, say your income goes above the essential plan limits, you'll be transitioned uh, into a qualified health plan, unlike in Medicaid. Uh, and again, the income that's used, that you can use for Medicaid, you can use the current monthly income. You cannot do that in the essential plan. You have to use your projected 12-month income. So uh, as we've mentioned, uh, there are a few uh, helpful links that we've uh, already drawn your attention to. Uh, one of them, uh, another one is you can click on this link here. Once you get the slides, then it'll direct you to the, uh, the essential plan, a longer uh, list of the benefits and cost sharing for your information. And then again, we want to highlight the immigration coverage crosswalk that you can get from Empire Justice's website. Um, and uh, we will also, again, we have that one pager that you can find on your GoToWebinar bar. And uh, keep an eye out for the, the Google form that will be the online questionnaire uh, to assess uh, potential eligibility in marketplace uh, coverage. So with that, uh, why don't we transition into questions? We've got about 10 minutes left, uh, so we can try and get through as many as we can. Okay, hi, this is Amy. So I have a, um, I've gotten a few questions forwarded from, uh, from you guys, and they're great questions. So let me start. One, the first question I have is, how is the state going to save money by introducing the essential plan? Basically, this is from the transition of the people who are getting Medicaid at state-only cost to the essential plan. So the people who are the lawfully present illicit immigrants, right now the only people paying for their health care is New York State. When they move to the essential plan, the federal government will be contributing towards their health insurance um, and there's a formula based on what the state would have gotten if these people were getting advanced premium tax credits. But what it, the, what it basically means is for the first time New York is going to get some federal assistance paying for the cost of their care. Okay, then there's a question whether pre-call only immigrants could be undocumented immigrants. No. Pre-call only are a specific category, a specific people. Um, some of them include people who are applying for immigration statuses. But people who are undocumented, that really means that they don't have an immigration status at all. And that includes people who have entered the United States across a border without inspection, without going through customs and immigration, or they've overstayed a visa. Um, this question is whether someone can get, without a social security number, cannot get an individual plan. I, I didn't say that, so I'm not sure what the uh, confusion was. But if whoever asked that question wants to send a follow-up, we can answer, uh, I can try to answer it. Um, will we update the crosswalk to include the essential plan? Actually, Empire Justice's crosswalk does include the essential plan, but it includes it under its old name because it changed its name right after we updated it. So if you look at the crosswalk, the first column that has insurance coverage, it says exchange slash, slash basic BHP, that's the basic health program, it's the same thing. But good point, it sounds like something we may need to update. And just, I just want to say, I'm going to go through a few questions, and I want to give Andrew a chance, because I don't want to just stick with just the immigration questions. Um, if I don't get to your questions, there is going to be some, we're going to try to do some follow-up and uh, get back to people as well. Clients who are below the 250% of poverty, are they rolled into the essential plan, or do we have to update the application? Whether someone has to update their application is going to depend on whether or not the state can verify their information at renewal. So it's the, sort of the same process as last year. So if somebody is able to, um, w if they don't have to update their application, then they they still may they still are going to have to select an essential plan unless the state does that auto enrollment that they're considering. And just to clarify here, the question was 250% of poverty. The essential plan only goes up to 200% of poverty. 
when will the essential plans be available for viewing? This is the 60,000, 64,000 million? I don't know. They changed it. Dollar question. Uh, we don't know. What we do know is that the state knows what the plans are. It's not clear they know what the networks are, and they've been uploading the information into their portals in September. But we don't have that information. I mean, it has to come out soon because come November 1st, people will be choosing a plan. But right now, we don't have that information. And believe me, we are anxious to get it. So Andrew, do you want to take a few, and then I can come back to these, just so we have time? Sure. We might do that. Uh, we had a question about uh, the PCP co-payment for people with incomes between 150 and 200 percent of the poverty level. Uh, and would that be for non-preventive services? Just want to quickly point out, yes, uh, as under the ACA, uh, there is no charge for preventive services. So a non-preventive trip uh, would not have cost sharing. Uh, there was a good question about um, the, the enrollment scenario with the consumer uh, who falls into the category of below 138% uh, of the poverty level and is in uh, a lawfully present illicit immigrant. And the question is about how will he access benefits. And that's a very good question because I briefly showed the slide um, where we had two columns of using the essential plan card and using the Medicaid card. Uh, so let's uh, consider that for him, he does not have a long-term care need, so he's in the essential plan, uh, but he still has access to uh, some of the services that he previously had under Medicaid. So for most of the services, he's going to uh, receive them through the essential plan, so his essential plan. So whatever carrier he picks, um, he'll get those essential health benefits, and he'll also get those additional benefits like dental and vision. Uh, He'll use his essential plan card for that and for the uh, orthotic devices. Um, that'll all be through the essential plan. The only uh, way that he'll get uh, where he'll need the Medicaid card is for those few other additional services that uh, DOH will be covering directly, uh, that non-emergency medical transportation and um, for those free access services for family planning. Uh, so most of it will be just uh, through the essential plan and with the essential plan insurance card. So for those uh, immigrants who must select an uh, essential plan by December 31st, what happens if they do not enroll? Will they uh, be automatically enrolled? That's a really good question. Um, and if uh, the consumer doesn't need to enter any additional information, uh, and there is a sister uh, essential plan. So if they have, if the carrier for their Medicaid managed care plan is also offering the essential plan, uh, if they do not pick a plan, they will automatic they'll be likely auto assigned into that sister plan. Uh, and I believe, and Amy, you can uh, double check and uh, say if I'm not correct on this, but. I believe if there is no uh, sister plan and they do not pick a plan for this group, the illicit immigrants, they will be auto-assigned to a plan. Actually, that's not, um, they will be, they will have to choose a plan. And that's something we need to keep an eye out for so that we can make sure people get into a plan. Um, I did ask whether there would be, I mean, I've, I sort of have asked the state to to think about that one, but right now the last I heard was they will if you there's no sister plan you have to choose a plan, even if you're moving over from Medicaid managed care. No, oh, great. Uh, we have a good question. I'll I'll take uh, one more here and then I'll throw it back to Amy. Uh, how will the government determine pregnancy status and what documentation will the enrollee be required to submit to prove that they are not pregnant? Uh, that's a really good question and one that we'll need to be looking out for um, as this moves along uh, because there are definitely issues of making sure we promote continuity of care for uh, women who become pregnant uh, as they transition from the essential plan into Medicaid. Um, and that's something that I don't believe has been officially worked out, how exactly someone will be notified. Um, 
So that's one of the things we'll definitely be looking at uh, as the essential plan unrolls. Okay, great. So um, we have a bunch more questions, and but we've run out of time. And what we are going to do actually is download the questions and go through them and see if we can email a sort of a group list of answers to the questions. These are all really great questions. You can tell from Andrew my presentation that um, you know basically the essential plan really is a more affordable option for for people in New York. Um, we we want to make sure people get continuity of care, as Andrew said, but it also it's just added a new layer of complexity to how we understand who is eligible for what. And so we're we're really hopeful that this will be a great product for people. Um, but we as advocates are going to need to be mindful of making sure that that the essential plan works for people and that people are able to access the benefits that they're entitled to. So I want to thank everybody for joining us and uh, happy Friday. <laughs>